Hello. So I'm going to read you another chapter from the book I've written, but um, if you saw the previous one, obviously this is in a slightly different style of video, so we'll go with it and see how it goes, but it's going to be quite long. Chapter 2, The Morning After. That's it. I'm never drinking again. The first thing I notice on waking is the herd of elephants stampeding through my head. Groaning, I clutch my head and open my eyes, immediately getting a sinking feeling. Not again. Two days in a row, damn it. My surroundings are painfully familiar. I've been in these cells enough times, thanks to Slack, that bastard. I know where I am. The question is, why am I here again? But that is not the biggest issue for the moment. I feel as if I've been hit by a bus. Sitting up on the cold, hard bunk, pain hits me from all over, and that feeling you get just before you throw up creeps up on me, leaving me grateful I haven't eaten yet. Gagging, I groan again, and rub my face, yawning groggily. My wounded arm feels like it's been ripped right off. I have to touch it just to reassure myself it's still there. Oh God, it hurts so much. Searching my cotton wool-filled mind, I try to remember why I'm here. I know what was in Rhinestone with Amber, Ryan, Nick and Dan, maybe Lorena too, but then what? I don't remember leaving the club, let alone how I got involved with the police. I wasn't that drunk, was I? I notice a tray on the floor and my nausea intensifies. Lifting it onto the bunk, a wave of dizziness it hits me and I survey the contents. The toast is so blackened it's practically a slice of ash. Any fragments of toasted bread that remain inside, all that is holding it together. There is also a scrambled egg. At least I think that's what it is. It looks so rubbery it might be fake. The rest of it's just as bad. Pulling a face, I set the tray down on the beside me on the bed and lift the cup of water to my lips, wishing it was coffee or something stronger. This has got to be the worst hangover I've ever had. I mean, I've been hungover before, too many times to count, but it's never felt this bad. It feels so much worse, a new word needs to be invented just to describe it. I wish these holding cells were equipped with more than just an uncomfortable bunk, although there is no guarantee cold water on my face would make any great improvements to my condition, I do need to pee. Moving the tray back onto the floor, I lay on the bunk and clutch my head in my hand, staring up at the blotchy ceiling. <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense. I'm not a violent drunk. I'm not even violent sober. Sure, I can defend myself if somebody started on me, but I wouldn't go out of my way to get into a fight. I have no idea what I'm doing here, and it would be easier to think straight if I didn't hurt so much. Excuse me. <clears throat> Looking myself over, I am dismayed at the state of my shirt. It started out the night clean and crisp, but now it's torn, missing a couple of buttons, and disturbingly covered in patches of someone's blood. I hope it's not mine. Remembering where I am, a chill passes over me, and I wonder if I should rephrase that. The white bandage on my arm is now red, where the wound has bled out and dried over. My arm is also streaked with rivers of dried blood. The stitches must have popped, damn it. Excuse me. I want gas. Bad time to have gas. Yo, God, I yell as loud as I can, getting to my feet and banging on the cell door. Whoa, getting up was a mistake. Pressing my palms against the back of the door, I rest my head against it and pray the wave of dizziness doesn't wash me into unconsciousness. The grill in the door slides open without warning. What? The guard snaps, his tone impatient. I have the worst headache, officer, I grimace, looking at him through narrowed eyes. Can you give me something for the pain? See what I can do, he grunts. The grill slams shut and his heavy jangling footsteps retreat. Sorry, can't get the word out. Thanks, I say to the door. I collapse onto the bunk again, my head still spinning. It's so cold down here. Man, I can't wait to go home. It's very warm outside, being July and all, but you wouldn't know it from down here. I'm freezing. These holding cells are literally in the depths of hell, and contrary to popular opinion, hell is icy cold. Or maybe it's frozen over. That old saying comes to mind, you know, when women say, I'll do X as soon as hell freezes over. Well, this is it. Hell is frozen, baby. Pay up. I drove up from London yesterday. We were given the weekend off work, and it's nice to get a chance to come home. I think it has more to do with Roland's new women than anything else. We all get a long weekend off from filming, and he gets to fly back to LA to bonus mistress. 
I should have expected to find what I did when I came home yesterday. I don't know why I was surprised to find Slack there. It's such a joke. Where's the justice? I get arrested while he gets to walk away. And what does Charlie get? A stay in hospital, that's what. It makes me sick. The sound of keys rattling in the door and the tumblers falling open shakes me out of my revere. I look towards the door as the custody sergeant steps into the cell. Mr Miller, he sighs deeply, and I get that feeling you get when you've done something wrong and someone has found you out. Missed me, did you? <coughs> I swing my legs round and sit up on the edge of the bunk. Apparently I did, I grimace, pressing one hand to my head. He steps closer and hands me two polystyrene cups. Here, how do you feel? I look wordlessly into the cups. One contains two small white tablets and the other is full of a clear liquid. Paracetamol, Mike. The sergeant says. It's the best I can do. Throwing the contents into my mouth one cup at a time, I catch a taste of the powdery pills. Thanks, Sarge, I grimace. You're a lifesaver. Can I go now? Not this time. You've really outdone yourself, haven't you? He says, his tone grim, the serious look on his face making me nervous. I have, I frown, a sinking feeling setting in as I start to feel scared. Listen, I need you to eat something, he says. <coughs> Noticing the untouched breakfast, I shake my head wordlessly, the pain, pain accompanying the motion, and try harder to recall what happened in the club last night. This is worse than last week. I had no memory problems with that, but nor did I get arrested. It's no good. Much of last night is fuzzy. I would liken it to spinning round on a fairground carousel ride when the surrounding world just passes in a blur of colour. That pretty much describes my night. I noticed the sergeant talking, but failed to catch the words. Sorry, what? I frown. Never mind, he sighs, shaking his head. I glance down at the blood on my shirt and go back to the night out in London last weekend. I'd felt my elbow collide with something behind me and watched Eve's expression turn to pure shock. Turning to look, I saw Kelly and felt all the breath leave my body, knowing instantly what had happened. She was on her back on the bar floor, her hands over her face, screaming and crying in agony whilst blood crept across her face and seeped through her fingers. It was horrific. I can still hear her agonised cries in my mind and it makes me want to break down myself. It was so hard to listen to, especially knowing I was the cause. Come on, Miller. I look up at the Sarge, blinking. Huh? He snaps his fingers. On your feet, sunshine. These are for you. Let's go already. I notice for the first time the pair of handcuffs he is holding and stand up. I've got other things to do, Miller. Let's just get this over with, OK? There is a metallic rattling sound as he secures the cuffs on my wrists, mercilessly with my hands in front of me. Looking over his shoulder as he does this, I see his uniformed companion loitering just outside the open cell door in the hallway. Where are we going? I groan. This headache is going to kill me before the day is done. He nudges me out the door ahead of him, <clears throat> and his silent companion grabs my elbow before leading me along the hallway. Disneyland, Sarge replies shortly. Come on, you know the drill. While we walk along in silence, I try to construct a way to ask why I'm here without sounding stupid. Now, to be honest, I'm having a bit of trouble remembering last night. Maybe you can help me out. Why am I here? What am I supposed to have done? I ask. Oh, nothing much, Sarge replies, his voice heavy with exaggerated sarcasm. Just some D&D &D and resisting with a little ABH on a police officer on the side. He can't be serious. Oh, no, I exhale. Exhale. A drunk and disorderly charge isn't anything to lose sleep over, but resisting arrest and assault? I just don't do that kind of thing. And that's just for starters, Sarge says, glancing at me totally serious now. Panic starts to bubble up inside me, increasing my nausea and subduing any self-assurances that I can simply talk my way out of this. There has been a mistake, I say, grateful they have brought me to the toilets. As I relieve myself and splash water on my face, all I can think about is how much my head hurts. I am strangely grateful when we get upstairs. It is no noticeably warmer up here, not by much, but enough to make a difference. Excuse me. Sarge silently directs me into an open doorway, and the officer holding my elbow provides a lot of unnecessary help. The interview room is pretty small, nothing like it looks on those TV cop shows. 
Sarge's silent companion is not yet done. I am seated rather unceremoniously on one side of the table that is set against the opposite wall. I glare at his back, irritation bristling, as he stations himself near the door. Sarge has disappeared now. Damn it, my elbow hurts and I can't even rub it shackled like this. Looking around the room, I notice the retro tape machine adorning the empty table. This is very, very bad. I don't remember any of what he says. I did, but it's not right. Did he say there was more? I think I'm going to be sick. Twisting my hands in the cuffs, I rest my elbows on the table and rest my head in the crook of my good arm. Maybe he was messing with me and there aren't any more charges. But why would we be having a sit-down if that was the case? Jesus, I thought assaulting an officer was bad enough. What else could there be? Or maybe he's more seriously injured than you imagined for an actual bodily harm charge. Either possibility is pretty devastating, depending on what these other offences are. Lifting my head, I glanced at my guard. He stood in a classic military pose, legs apart and arms behind his back, while staring into space with a vacant, glazed expression on his face. How long is this going to take? I don't think I can handle the suspense. If I didn't feel so sore and ill, I could probably doze off, although the butterflies parading my stomach might hamper that somewhat. It's so quiet in here. Listening to the noises in the building, I can hear multiple footsteps as, as staff traverse some staircase somewhere nearby, and steady footsteps pounding a corridor somewhere. My ears also catch the periodic, periodic murmur of passing voices, but not well enough to decipher any of the words. I hope they aren't keeping me waiting on purpose. It's not that I have somewhere else to be. It's just that this is so very painful, the waiting. I don't feel more, more willing to talk, just more certain I'm actually going to vomit. And when I'm done with that, I might just die of boredom. Excuse me again, sorry. I'm used to being busy, having something to do, and can't stand sitting around on my arse. It makes me antsy. The only exception is when I'm relaxing. And I think you'll agree, this is anything but... Then there is the hangover. I feel like I'm dying. When is that paracetamol going to start working? It normally doesn't matter if I can't remember the night before. If anything, it means it's a sign that I had a hell of a good night. The last time I partied that hard was when I hooked up with Eve Mackenzie. I sure wish I'd known what I've let I was letting myself in for with that one, but that's a different kettle of fish. I know I was in Rhinestone with the guys, but I don't remember leaving the club or anything out of the ordinary happening afterwards. All this effort is hurting my head. I want to go back to bed. I think he gave me fake paracetamol. It's not doing much for my hangover. Staring down at the handcuffs binding my wrists together, I start counting the silver links hanging between my wrists, thinking that nobody is actually coming. One, two, three, four... Hearing footsteps, I look up as a smartly dressed man and woman enter the room. Looks like I spoke too soon. Morning, Mr Miller, the woman says with a smile. But the smile does not reach her eyes. I watch her take a seat across the table from me and set down the brown cardboard file she was carrying. I open my mouth to repeat the greeting back, but all that comes out is a yawn. Keeping you up, are we? the man remarks. I scowl at him. I'm not sure I like his tone. He sits down beside her and folds his hands on the tabletop. I'm Detective Fisher and this is Detective Hemming, he says. Do you know why you're here? Meeting his intense stare, I slowly shake my head, surprised he's even asking. We'll get to that, he says, taking away my brief hope that he's going to tell me. Fisher nods at Hemming. On cue, she pushes some buttons on the tape recorder set against the wall, starting it rolling. Interview with Michael Miller commenced at, she pauses and looks at her watch, 11.10am, Saturday, July 4th. She carries on talking, but I stop listening, instead looking at her companion. Fisher looks middle-aged and has piercing, all-seeing eyes. If ever you could accuse somebody of having eyes like a cop, it's this guy. He seems very comfortable sat here in this room. Maybe he's been doing this job a long time. Firstly... Let me remind you that you are under arrest, he says. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you fail to mention when questioned something which you will later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? I look at Hemming, feeling an uncomfortable knot forming in my throat. She looks at Eves and is watching me expectantly. Yes, my voice sounds hoarse, my throat now drier than a martini. I clear my throat. I do. 
Do you wish to have your solicitor present, Mr Miller? That's a good question. I feel certain that I haven't, that I haven't done anything wrong, despite appearances, although it must be pretty bad if two detectives have taken the time to have a sit-down with me. No, I rasp, my voice still playing up. Clearing my throat again, I shake my head for added clarity. I wiggle in the chair, starting to get a numb bump from sitting here for so long already and wait for them to tell me about last night. Hemming tells the tape recorder that I shook my head, denying counsel. I stare down at the brown file on the table for a moment and wonder what's in it. It's kind of chunky. Then Hemming asks me to run them through last night. I look at them both, watching me expectantly, and get the feeling they are waiting for some kind of admission of guilt. Licking my lips, I begin with the drinks we had at the Crown on Earlham Road. What sort of time was this? Fisher asks. I don't like it when he looks at me like that. Something in his eyes make me feel uncomfortable, in a way I can't even describe. I don't think I've ever met anybody like this before. His hazel eyes are so piercing and intense. Why does he have to watch me that whole time? Searching my memory for the answer to his question, I draw a blank. I really couldn't tell you. Early evening or sometime, I say, puffing out my cheeks. Excuse me again. They quiz me on my friends. I go through the three that I was with that night. Ryan Ackle is a fellow actor, Dan Lewis is a local mechanic, and Nick Murphy is a Suffolk police detective. I decide not to mention Amber. It's not fair to drag her into this too. Excuse me. Then they zero in on Nick and question me on him. How long have I known him? Where does he work exactly? Was he with me all night? Do they want his national insurance number and shoe size too? I've known Nick for years, since before I made it big. Back when, I met him back when I used to work with Dan in some little backstreet garage that has long since closed down. He's just a mate. I don't get why they seem to care so much. If I'm sure none of it is relevant to what happened last night, whatever that was. After drinking in the pub, we went to Rhinestone, I say. I fold my fingers in my lap and stare down at them, trying to avoid noticing Fisher's stare. And then what? He prompts. I shrug my shoulders, my eyes still fixed on my hands, and try to count the links joining ha the handcuffs again, trying to distract myself from the anxiety knotting my stomach. I really don't know what else he expects me to say. We drank a lot and danced a bit, then called it a night, I say. Usually Nick leaves early because he has to be fit for work. Ryan and I catch a cab back to my place, and Dan does his own thing, sometimes going home, sometimes staying later than us. So why was last night different? Hemming asks, a creaking noise accompanying her words. What happened when you left the club? I glance up at her and see if she is leaning forward, her elbows resting on the table now. I don't know, I admit grimacing. Staring down into my lap, I shrug again. That's where my night ends. Nothing. Really, Fisher says. His tone makes me feel like I'm a kid again, getting told off for some heinous wrongdoing. Looking up at him and meeting his hawkish stare, I see that his lips are pressed into a tight line and his eyebrows are drawn down over his bright eyes. Is that all you've got to say about it? He's beginning to rub me the wrong way and I'm starting to feel defensive. I'm also starting to develop this irresistible urge to poke his eyes out. Look, that's all I can remember, I reply, sounding defensive. Everything else is a blur. Maybe you can throw a little information my way, huh? He stares at me for a long moment and I stare back, feeling the muscles in my jaw flexing as I press my teeth together hard. The only other sound in the room is the low hiss of the tape recorder. Damn him and his cop eyes, it's weird that it's that which is contributing most to my shredded nerves. The police have never made me feel this uncomfortable before. I feel like I'm on trial already. OK, Miller, he says finally with a slight nod over the head. His voice is neutral, leaving me as confused as ever and rendering his words meaningless. OK, what? He believes me, maybe? Hemming pulls something out of the fold and slides it across the table towards me. Do you recognise this young woman, Michael? She asks. It's a photograph, a headshot of a young woman, and I feel pretty certain that I've never seen her before in my life. Let the record show that Detective Herming has shown Mr Miller a photograph of the victim, Fisher says, for the benefit of the tape. The victim? 
I glance up at him sharply before regarding the pretty smiling young blonde in the photo more closely. The photo really captures her youth. She is young but not a child. I'd guess her to be about 20 years old and I definitely don't know her. I can feel both pairs of eyes on me, watching my reaction maybe. Well, Heming prompts, I'm not sure I like where this is going. Looking up from the photograph, my eyes flicker between the two detectives. Never seen her before. Fisher has got his knowing eyes trained on me. I wish he'd stop looking at me like that. My nerves are already shot as it is. Maybe you'll remember her better looking like this, Hemming says, reaching into the folder again. I watch her lay several more photographs across the table in front of me, each more horrific than the last, and feel the bile rising in my throat. These photos are presumably the same young lady, but she is no longer smiling. Oh God, I gasp, horror struck, covering my mouth with my hands. Her face is heavily bruised, all swollen up and bloody. Her neck has disturbingly finger-shaped bruises on it, and I can't bear to look at the rest of her. Turning my head away, I close my eyes and concentrate on trying to keep the vomit inside my body. Lost in the stomach-churning images, I fail to grasp how serious this situation is. The photos are clearly evidence, which Fisher confirms for the benefit of the tape. Why don't you tell us what happened? Hemming says softly. That's when the penny drops. I think I'm going to be sick. I blurt out as my blood runs cold. All oh, coming back now, is it? Heming questions. There is a nasty undertone to her voice, but that emotion does not show on her face. I lick my lips. You think I did that to her? I gasp, the trauma of this revelation bringing out my American twang and making me sound odd, like the half-breed that I am. My eyes return to the horrific photographs as shock sets in. Saying it out loud makes it feel more real. How on earth did this happen? I'd never do something like that. How can they think I did this? No, we know you did, she practically purrs. We have the victim's statement and there were reliable witnesses. Suddenly the custody sergeant's words pop into my head. What about the injured police officer? I frown. The two of them exchange a look and I immediately regret mentioning it. And which officer would that be? Fisher asks, cocking his head slightly to one side. His voice is full of suspicion and his eyebrows drawn down over his eyes again as he continues to watch me like a hawk. I don't know, I admit. Damn it, what did I mention him for? What an idiot. Stupid, stupid. Fisher leans forward across the table, his eyes more intense than ever. This will go a whole lot easier on you if you just admit to everything, he purrs. His voice is low and his whole attitude makes me feel like he just threatened me. Tilting my face upwards, I rub my hands over it and stare at the ceiling, trying not to let him antagonise me. Sliding my hands over my head, I squeeze my elbows together painfully in front of my face. This can't be happening. It just can't be happening to me. I'm not really here. This is... it's just a dream. This is bullshit, I tell the ceiling. Excuse me again. Well... Releasing the muscles holding my elbows, I press my lips together and meet his stare. I have never met that girl in my life. I wasn't there, and you can't prove otherwise. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, where was I? Fisher laughs, sounding genu genuinely amused, and leans back in his chair. You know the really interesting thing, Miller, he says quite casually. Your injuries are consistent with a woman having fought you off. There is a hint of a smile on his lips, and the animosity I felt from his, him is momentarily subdued. That's funny, right? He adds. I set my hands back in my lap and wonder why I'm surprised he's mentioning that. My injuries are incidental, and she certainly get, didn't give them to me. I smile tightly, wondering if it's obviously forced. I make the mistake of glancing down at the tabletop. Will you please put those away, for God's sake? Irritation mars my voice as I fight the urge to sweep them onto the floor. I didn't think it was possible, but I'm starting to think my headache is in fact getting worse, not better. So the blood we found under her fingernails won't match yours then? Heming asks. I did not harm that woman, I reply, forcing my voice to remain as normal as possible. Raising my hand up, my hands up, I print the bridge of my nose between my thumb and forefinger. Damn that stupid paracetamol. It's clearly worthless against a headache of this magnitude. You know... 
Coincidence is a funny thing, Hemming muses. Do you recall that incident last weekend? I frown at her, having drawn a blank, and try hard to remember what she's talking about. That bar of salt you had to hand in, and I think your girlfriend was also involved somehow, she goes on. Jesus, really? She's actually bringing this up. I should have seen it coming. It wasn't an assault. It was an accident. There was no crime. What happened with Kelly LaHare is completely irrelevant and has absolutely no bearing on this case. I sigh, gradually beginning to feel exhausted by this whole experience. Maybe you noticed, but I wasn't even arrested for that. You have no idea how bad I feel. Well, Miss LaHare may have brought that rubbish, but you can't argue the same thing here. It simply won't stand up in court, Fisher says. Fed up of his attitude, I scowl at him and lean forward across the table. Listen to me very carefully, I hiss, the words coming out through my teeth. I'm innocent. Damn it, I'm letting him get the better of me. That would probably be more plausible if it wasn't delivered with such anger. Fisher says nothing. He simply carries on watching me in a very predatory manner, and I'd swear he's smiling. Don't tell me he, ha he enjoys this crap. He's a very sick man, if that's the case. Well, if you're so innocent, your DNA will clear you, Hemming says, won't it? No, 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 no. She's not suggesting what I think she's suggesting. Sorry. Gasping for breath a little, I feel my stomach convulsing and a shiver surges through my body. DNA? I parrot, my jaw sagging. The horror I felt before is nothing compared to how I feel at this moment as the full ramif ramifications of her words sink in. A fresh wave of dizzy nausea washes over me and my hands begin to shake uncontrollably. This is worse than I could possibly have imagined. Or is there something you would like to tell us, Fisher purrs suggestively. They are not just talking about assault here. I'm pretty sure there's only one thing DNA evidence is needed for. Oh my god. I choke out a gut-wrenching cough, but only bile comes up. You've got me confused with someone else. I gasp breathlessly, my eyes wide with fear. I did not rape that young woman. No way, no how. Rape? Heyman questions, feigning surprise as she turns to her partner, all innocent. Did you say anything about rape, Craig? Not me, Cheryl. Fisher says, his tone almost matching hers. I think he knows more than we do. Their acting skills are laughable. If this situation wasn't so serious and terrifying, I'd laugh at them. Besides, if they think they know so much, why are they even talking to me? This is ridiculous, and a big waste of time. Don't try that tactic on me. Why would you even mention DNA unless she was raped, I say, trying not to shake. I may not remember what happened, but I, I don't even know her. I may not be at my best this morning, but it seems clear to me they came into this room already certain of my guilt. I guess they must have already spoken with this poor victim, whoever she is. It's probably doesn't even matter what I say. There is only one version of events they are going to believe, and it's not my sorry excuse for a story. Stranger rape is rare, I'll give you that, Fisher says, but it doesn't. Ha but it does happen, so you not knowing her means nothing. Just to prove my point, thanks, Fisher, and thanks for confirming that she was raped. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. My hands are still shaking. Whether it's from the initial shock, the fear or the adrenaline, I don't know, but it's causing the handcuffs to clink together very audibly. Excuse me. Glancing down at the evidence photos for the tenth time, I lose my patience and scoop them up. Her injuries are sickening, I say, casting the photos over their heads in a shower. But I did not cause them, and forcing me to look at them for the remainder of the day is not going to change that. I return my hands to my lap, hoping they haven't noticed the shaking. To them it had been no doubt merely... It had no doubt be merely further proof of my guilt somehow. Sorry, <laughs> I can't get that sentence out in the right order. That was uncalled for, Heming says. She frowns at me, her tone regressing me back to childhood again, and Dick takes my action to the date recorder. I'll just drop the act, Fisher snaps unsympathetically. But I didn't hurt her. How many ways can I say it? I really don't know what else to say, so I just stare at him moodily. I'm feeling so many different emotions right now. I don't know which one I feel the most. I wish this torture would end. Heming pushes her chair back and crouches on the floor. I imagine she's probably collecting the scattered photographs. 
If you hadn't run when you were challenged by a police officer, I might have bought that, Fisher says. He is wearing a stony expression that doesn't give much away, but I can hear the impatience in his tone and a hint of anger. Hemming stares at me across the tabletop for a moment. What do you have against Officer Farrell? she asks, sounding genuinely surprised. She wasn't even there for you. Why did you single her out for that assault? What you did to the first victim wasn't enough, was it? She didn't quite do it for you. She goes back to whatever she's doing down there on the floor, leaving me staring at the side of her head aghast. Speechless with shock, I try to remember what she's talking about. These accusations are shocking. I just wish I could assure myself that they are making them up. What a night to get blind drunk. 